Okay. My name is Mathilde, and if you want, I wash your board for 1,000 euro or dollar, it's like you want, every day with different bikini. It's very cheap. <laughs> you know? It's very, very cheap, and I do this with a lot of love and passion. So amazing, is it? So, if you want my service, call Jimmy. Your agent? Yes. My agent, Jimmy. Take 20% more uh, than 1,000. So he got you 1,000 and 200 euro. Oh, this, this. It's all. was that woman in the opening credits and that wasn't Esper? No, that was the delectable Mathilde who I met last year when I was on my own. That's the lovely thing about Pyam of course is meeting people that you've met there before. It is one of those places I think people discover and they go back to time and again. Mm. The boat by the way was Dallinghu and mm. that was a gaff rig schooner that Liz and I delivered to Copayam in April of last year. Uh, she was fitted out in Myanmar and she sailed down to Phuket and then we jumped on board for a few days to take her back up to Copayam and beyond. But anyway, if you want Mathilde services, and don't forget it's one bikini every day, then uh, get in touch with me because I'm her agent. Yeah, and I want half the commission. Yeah, right. So this is our last episode based in Copayam. If you want some nautical action, you're going to see it next week because we're heading up to Ko Chang, which is even more remote than Copayam. Mm. Uh, and it's the final island before Burma. Yep. So hit that subscription button and you'll get notified when we put that episode out next week, hopefully. Yeah. So in this week's episode, we're going to mix it up a little bit because we're here now. Jamie was here on his own last year, so you're going to see some footage from both the visits. And the one that I think is probably the most exciting is our trip to the Mokan village mm. on Payam. They are sea gypsies, Choi Li, got lots of different names for them, but they are the original native inhabitants of this part of the world, aren't they? Yep. Well, more on that in a moment. First of all, what about this crappy weather we've been having? As you are aware, we've told you about this um, weather front pattern thing that's kind of disrupting the northeasterlies that we should be expecting. Yep. What have we got, Liz, out there? We've got a rather terrifying looking big bank of cloud rolling in straight at us. It's a sort of pewter grey black colour. Yes, and it's going to, it's going to piss it down. Yeah, it is. Well, look at this. Unbelievable, this. Look, sunny, sunshine. This is the first sun we have had in days. It's been almost a week, I think, of just solid rain. And we're deciding to go back to Cha Chai House because we love it so much there. And you can see right now, we're at the other end of the bay. So Esther's parked up all the way over there. Our dinghy, meanwhile, is behind us up this slope here. And the reason for that is it's a spring high water. And this means that the, uh, the shore, um, sorry, the, the sea comes right in. Now, it's still coming in this morning and you can see there's not much space between the sea there and this wall here. And uh, you can see also, if I turn around, this is where the water comes up. So that's the first problem we've got, it's an unusually high tide. And the second thing of course is that we've had this uh, terrible weather which has meant that the uh, sea has come up closer to the walls than uh, it has done previously. So we're not taking any chances, we're going to go into town for a few hours which means that uh, the tide will come right up and we don't want to risk having our dinghy bashed against the brick wall here. So the restaurant's very kindly allowed us to put the dinghy up there. Jamie, where are we? Okay, we are in Klong Kling. It means hornbill. Hornbill, because of course there are many hornbills flying up and down, specifically in this uh, on this beach. Uh, we see hornbills day and night, and that's why Klong Kling Restaurant has two 
beautifully carved hornbills sitting atop an old tree trunk at the front of their restaurant. These are Med Wang Wang or Caillou. Caillou is easier to say. It's cashew. And this is what uh, Koh Payam is famous for. Um, I originally was told that Payam is cashew, but it's not. Payam means try harder and try again. But uh, anyway, this is Caillou. And this is what the island is famous for. And we have just come to the tail end of the cashew season. But the reason why I wanted to talk about these is that I find them fascinating. This is basically a fruit and it, when it grows on the tree, it grows like this. And this is the cashew nut, you can see the cashew nut underneath. It's also probably why cashew nuts are quite expensive because every single cashew nut, one cashew nut grows on one fruit. So it's quite labor intensive, of course, to, to pick these off the tree. Uh, what I particularly like about these though is as you are walking through a cashew nut, a caillou plantation, when the fruit lands on the floor and gets crushed, it has the same smell as um, apples or pears. In fact, if you, you, know, if you scratch, scratch it and smell it, it really does, it smells like a, a fresh apple. Uh, it's not edible though, you, c you can't eat this, uh, I'm sure many animals do, uh, but uh, of course this is what we're really after, the, the cashew nut itself. But they're beautiful and you know the whole of the island, Koh Payam, is full of cashew nut plantations. Liz and I have just been driving around today, uh, as I say it's the tail end, but there are still quite a few of these growing in the trees. They're quite distinctive and beautiful looking thin. We're at the very tip of a place called, is it called Sea View Resort? And we walked up to the top to get a good look view round and you can see the sea behind you on that side and behind me on this side. And if you were gonna stay at the Sea View Resort on Koh Payam, you need to stay here, bungalow B10, because you get one hell of a sunset every night. We're surrounded by wildlife, butterflies the size of birds, and the smallest birds the size of butterflies. It's amazing. This is my idea of heaven. You know when you have to close your eyes and think of somewhere peaceful when you're relaxing and meditating? For me, it's always a meadow with butterflies and bees and birds, nothing that's stingy or painful. A lovely spring day, a little bit of a breeze, a bit of sun, sea over there, maybe a brook down there. And this is it.
So that was Lovely Dalling Who, a 99-foot schooner, which we helped to deliver from Phuket to Koh Phayan. It was a great journey. If you are interested in doing a similar journey and you'd like to hire Dalling Who, she is for hire and you can find her on dallingwho.com. We'll put a link in the description below. OK, have we got time for a quick question? We've always got time for a question. In fact, we did a whole week's worth of questions last week, a little mini-series, one question per day, and it generated a lot of interest and a lot of comments and a lot of discussion under each question. Yeah, and in fact, we enjoyed it so much, we're thinking of maybe doing it again sometime in the near future. So hit that subscription button now and you'll get notified both when our next vlog comes out and also when the next series of mini questions comes out. One of them was all about the water maker. And we get asked about the water maker and also water more generally a lot. Yeah. One particular question from YouTube. Yes, this was Jonathan Caney and he kind of sums up all of the questions in one long question. This is it. Do you guys make sure to take lots of supplements when drinking lots of water from the water maker? There is another couple sailing around the world and she hates drinking water from the water maker due to it being stripped of all minerals, etc. Mm. My understanding is Liz never had children, so the issues with suffering brittle bones is far lower than a woman who has had multiple children. <laughs> the wife in this couple basically gets all the bottled spring water during long passages or when clean water isn't easily found. I guess first thing we should say is, is that we don't have a problem drinking our water maker direct from the tanks. We've often thought about putting in a little filtration system. I know Seagull, for example, is one such manufacturer that uh, do an inline water filter, which you put just underneath your tap. We've heard good things about these. We've heard a lot of people say that it really does make a difference on the taste. Uh, me personally, I don't have a problem with it. Occasionally you sort of turn your nose up a bit, I think, don't you? I think. Yeah, sometimes my very, very delicate teas don't taste quite how they should, but I have no problem at all drinking water maker water or any old tank water, to be honest with you. Yeah, I mean, I tend to put it in a plastic bottle, which I then put in the fridge because I like my water cold. You don't drink yours cold so much and put, making it cold... Uh, helps get rid of any sort of nasty flavours. But our water tanks are fibreglass and we very occasionally may pour a little bit of bleach through them just maybe once a season just to get rid of any growth that may be in there. But so far over 10 years, I think because we are putting so much water through all the time, they are pretty clean, I'd say. Yeah, they are. They're fine and it does the job. We wash with our water from our tanks. We drink it. We use it in cooking. It's all good. Mm. Um, as for supplements and brittle bones and so forth, well, it's true, I don't have children, so maybe I'm less likely to get osteoporosis. I don't know. But when it comes to supplements, if you eat properly, you don't need supplements. That's our feeling. We don't take supplements. We eat really well here in Thailand. Lots and lots of fresh food, hardly any processed food. So no supplements for us. We also get asked about drinking water generally in some of these far-flung, more exotic countries. Um, um, I know a number of people are worried about getting hold of water here and they would only consider bottled water. Well, we've been drinking water from taps all the way from Turkey to Thailand, including India and, and the um, I think even in the African countries. Mm -hmm. Uh, we took it from the dock and we filled up our tanks. We do use a filter, as you said, but we've we've drunk water in every country. We've never had a problem through drinking water. No, I mean, there's a very good example of when we were in Eritrea, in Masawa, and we were offered water when we checked in at Customs and Immigration. And we said to the guys, well, do you drink the water? And they said, yes, we drink it. So we figured, well, if they drink it, it must be good enough for us. If the locals drink it and they suffer no ill effects, then we are quite comfortable. Um, That's our it. rule of thumb wherever mm. we go. If no one's getting dysentery, the water should be okay. They would all be ill if they were drinking. But of course, the difference is we've been moving very slowly from yeah. country to country. So our gut has built up different bacteria and flora and fauna as we've gone through. So I think perhaps we're more resistant to it. I think if you were to fly, say, from England to Bangalore and drank water out of the tap, you would have a problem because yeah. it would be full of all kinds of bacteria. It isn't necessarily bad for you, but your gut can't quite cope with it, isn't used to yet. And I do remember being told in India that Indians have a problem when they fly, fly to England. They're ill from the water there. So it's not about 
a nasty amoeba necessarily it's just a straightforward gut change having said that there are some dangerous places and you shouldn't drink from ditch water and you shouldn't drink in very very rural areas where there is dysentery and some very nasty waterborne diseases <laughs> Right, now on to something a bit more cultural. One of you in the YouTube comments recently said they wanted to see more local culture. So the first thing we've done is we've actually created a new playlist and put in all of our previous clips that relate to local culture. So that's a good starting point. But this week, whilst we were on Koh Payam, perhaps the highlight of our visit was to go and see a Mokan village. The Mokan are shy and they're quiet people. They keep themselves to themselves in their own village and they have their own way of, li of life. But they're quite happy for people to come in and have a walk round. Uh, sometimes they don't want you to film them. Sometimes they don't want pictures taken. Sometimes they don't even want to speak to you. But most of the time they're very, they're very smiley. The children running around. It was a really interesting place to see. But you do have to respect their privacy, don't mm -hmm. you? The Mokan are around two to 3,000 Austronesian people based around the Mergui Archipelago, which is a group of islands between Thailand and Burma, or Myanmar. Uh, they call themselves Mokan, uh, but they're also known as Sea Gypsies, uh, Chow Li, which means people of the sea, Chow Nam, which is people of the water, Selang, Sanom and Chalom. They're semi-nomadic and hunter-gatherers, but their lifestyle is under threat mainly through political and ecological reasons. Much of their time is spent at sea or on the shore diving and beachcombing. They barter for other necessities at local markets. Their wooden boats are called kabang and often accommodate a kitchen, bedroom and a living area. According to folklore, the Mokan are born, live and die on their boats and the umbilical cords of their children plunge into the sea. In fact, the children of the Mokan are able to see underwater better than us because of the amount of time they spend in it. Sadly, the Mokan have been harassed and driven away by illegal fishermen, jailed for lacking permits and prohibited from trading areas. To counter this, both the Myanmar and the Thai government have tried to settle the Mokan permanently into national parks as a tourist attraction. On top of that, their demography is declining Many of the young men die from the bends from diving too deeply and surfacing too quickly. Because of their ever restricted movement, it is becoming increasingly more difficult for young men to find spouses. The future of the Mokan is an uncertain one. <laughs> 